two weeks ago. I shouldn't say last time, because last time was Jack. <laughs> but I mean, two weeks ago, uh, we talked about um, really uh, not enabling people. And uh, we looked at the story of the prodigal son, and uh, we talked about waiting for them to return, not getting bitter. We talked about them, we talked about uh, how you can't force them to do what's right. It has to be a decision that they have to come to their own minds up on. Um, you know, when you have a rebellious child, when you have uh, someone who has left the church or something like that, it's not something that you can, uh, you can force them to do what's right. It has to be something that they have to choose um, to do. And uh, we also looked at the fact that you can't continue to provide, um, specifically financially. Um, because what happens is it, it'll blow up in your face and it'll also hurt them. Um, and one of the things about that with the parable of the prodigal son is it says that he came to his senses. It doesn't say that the father, you know, made him come to his senses. That's important to note. That's a very, very important point. The father had to let him do his thing because it had to be his choice to come back. Um, so I don't want people, so basically two weeks ago could be summarized in a simple statement, don't enable people. But I don't want you guys to think that Christians aren't supposed to be generous. So this is kind of the, the second part of that. Um, this is more of how to be generous. Okay, so um, I guess you could say we're looking more specifically about being in between two extremes. You know, you don't give to everyone, but you don't give to no one. This is, there is a biblical principle involved, and I will definitely show, show you that. We'll look at that. So the first thing, um, anytime you're talking about giving, and uh, you can go to Second Thessalonians, anytime that you're talking about giving, um, the first thing that is extremely important is you can't help those who don't want to be helped. Okay, that's a very important a very important point. Um, for instance, uh, if you're trying to help someone who is an alcoholic, um, you cannot make the decision for them. to They have to want to stop drinking. And what will happen is you'll actually just irritate yourself and get mad at them because you want them to get, stop drinking, and they won't. So then you go in this, you know, dancing around where, you know, and it doesn't work out. Because, once again, they did not make the decision. Or once again, with, uh, with um, drug addicts as well, um, it has to be something that um, they have to want to quit. If they do want to quit, you know, absolutely help them on that way. But, for instance, if you take them to some kind of a rehab, they'll just leave the program and go back to it. There has to be some sort of a desire. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. People... Um, will struggle, okay? People will struggle, and you have to be, you have to work with them, you have to be patient, but there is also a point where you have to be honest with yourself and with them, and if they're not willing to change, not ready to take that step, you can't help people who don't want to be helped. So if you look at 2 Thessalonians um, chapter 3, and verses 10 through 13, uh, these are just a few uh, notes that Paul's getting to here at the end. For even when we were with you, we used to give you this order. If anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. For we hear that some among you are leading an undisciplined life, doing no work at all, but acting like busybodies. Now such persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ to work in quiet fashion and eat their own bread. But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary of doing good. So there's a, kind of, there's a kind of big thing that's going on here. First off, there was an expectation that if they were able to, they should be. See? And so the first, the first group of people that I would say you really can't help are people who are lazy. Now, understand what I'm saying. I'm not saying people who don't work as hard as you. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about people who you give them food, and it'll just go bad because they set it on their counter instead of setting it in the fridge. Or you give them money and they just they just go out and blow it. You, you, you give them a job and they won't show up to do the work. Um, you cut them a deal and they just take advantage of it. The lazy people. Okay, now, I, I, I genuinely hope that nobody here is like that, but I'm not that dumb. <laughs> so, uh, the second thing is the person you cannot help is uh, someone who's an ex-Christian in other words, someone who has left the church in rebellion. I'm not talking about somebody who has moved. 
I'm talking about somebody who has left the church in rebellion. Because what is happening is they are rebelling against God. And if you support them in that, then you would have been siding with God's enemies. The Bible is absolutely clear on this. But we're just going to look at um, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11 says this. But actually, I wrote to you to, um, not to associate with so-called brothers, people who are calling themselves Christians, if he is an immoral person or covetous or an adulterer or a viler or a drunkard or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. Don't even break bread with this person. If they come over, do not, do not let them into your house. Do not associate with these people. Um, another example would be rebellious children. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 21, for instance, said, hey, if you have a rebellious ch child, go out and stone them. So that was a little intense. Uh, <laughs> I think that, obviously, I don't think that, uh, I'm, I'm not telling you guys to kill your kids who don't listen to you. Okay, calm down, calm down. What I am saying, though, is there is definitely a, a line that you can't, um, you can't continue to enable your children as they rebel against you, as they rebel against God. What you're doing is you're, you're shooting yourself in the foot once again, and you really are doing them a disservice. Because, once again, they will never be able to come to a place of coming to their senses if you're falling behind them, kicking up their messes. There comes a point where, as an adult, you have to own up to your own mistakes, learn from them, <coughs> And move on. And if you interfere with that process, you will cut the lesson that God is trying to teach them short. So, um, but I will look at 1 Samuel chapter 2, uh, verse 12 to 16. There's this, um, there's this, I don't know what you want to call him, I guess you just say priest. Uh, there's this priest whose name is uh, Eli, and he has these sons who are rebellious, not just towards him, but also towards God. And, um, well, let's just turn there. Second Sam 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 12. Now the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord and the custom of the priests with the people. Uh, when any man was offering a sacrifice, the priest servant would come while the meat was boiling with a three-pronged fork in his hand. Then he would thrust it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. All that the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. Thus they did in Shiloh to all the Israelites who came there. Also, before they burned the fat, the priest's servant would come out, come and say to the man who is sacrificing, Give the priest meat for roasting, as he will not take boiled meat from you, only raw. If the man said to him, They must surely burn the fat first, and then take as much as you desire, then he would say, No, but you shall give it to me now, and if not, I will take it by force. Thus the, sign, the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, for the men despised the offering of the Lord. There's a whole thing that's going on there. You can read the Old Testament for the specifics. But basically, they're rebelling against God. That's really the summarized version there. Once again, if you want the longer version, go read through the, the law. Um, well, anyways, it goes on through the story. And uh, it, down in verse 22, it says, Now Eli was very old, and he heard all that his sons were doing to all Israel, and how they lay with the women who served at the doorway of the tent of meeting. In other words, they were having sexual relationships with the people who were serving in the temple which they were not supposed to be doing. So just in case we're not clear there. He said to them, why do you do such things, the evil things that I hear from all these people? No, my sons, for the report is not good, which I hear the Lord's people circulating. If one man sins against another, God will mediate for him. But if a man sins against the Lord, who can intercede for him? But they would not listen to the voice of their father, for the Lord desired to put them to death. Now, Sam Eli did right in condemning his children there, yes. But he stopped there. He never took action when they refused to listen. And God judged him for it. If you read through the story, he removed Eli from his position and put another person from another family into the position. The person was actually Samuel, who the book was named for. So that's a whole other thing, though. Um, and so we see that it's not simply in words. It's in withdrawing the support. Once again, not helping people who don't want to be helped not continuing to enable a rebellious child to be rebellious. Well, I love them. If you really love them, you will do what's in their best interest. And remember, you are called to love God first, and then your children. And sometimes that means making very difficult choices, like choosing God and honoring God with your finances over the person. It's a very hard thing to do, and I genuinely hate that we have to make those kinds of decisions, but we do. We do. 
and another group of people who they have to come to a place of being re ready to be helped, uh, druggies and alcoholics. Once again, we like to look down on these kinds of people because, oh, well, you know, they're just nothings. But that would be a very, very big mistake to have such an attitude. Uh, Proverbs chapter 26, verse 11. And do pray for them. Do pray for them. But once again, if they're not ready to take that step, you will, you will only be enabling them to continue their lifestyle. Proverbs 26, 11 says, Like a dog that returns to its vomit is a fool who repeats his folly. And 1 Timothy 5, 8. says, But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than, is un than an unbeliever. So what we have is we have grown men who are not providing for their households. And then because we feel guilty, we step in and try to do the thing. See what I mean? And so we stick our fingers into something that wasn't something that we should have stuck our fingers in. Let's just leave it at that. So, um, in the law, uh, the land landowners had to leave some of their crops out for, pe for the poor to gather, but they were never told to gather it for the poor. They were told to leave it in the field for the poor. Now, why? Because if a person is in need, give them the opportunity to get up and go help themselves. But if they're not willing to go out and do the work, don't do the work for them because they have to be willing to be helped. They have to be willing to be helped. The law never once said, hey, gather it up for them too. And then take it to their house and then cook it for them. And then serve them. And then clean up after them. You know, once people reach adulthood, we should be expecting them and teaching them to act like adults. Because otherwise, we will keep them in a state of immaturity. And here's the thing. I really want you to grasp this, okay? When we refuse to grow physically, we will not grow spiritually. I want, I'm going to say that again because I, I want to make sure you understand what I'm saying. When we refuse to grow physically, we will not grow spiritually. Oh, well, I'm getting all kinds of revelations from God. Do you work? No. What are the chances that you actually are getting revelations from God? You sit on your butt all day. You don't, you don't pray, but you get all these special revelations from watching TV. If we're not disciplined in our spiritual life, we won't be disciplined in our physical life. It's, a, it's, it, it's the same. Okay? We, we want to eat McDonald's all day and then be healthy in our bodies. It's the same thing with our spirit. We don't want to read the Bible or pray, but then we want our spirit to be healthy. Okay? Help those who are ready to be helped. That's the first really big thing there. Even in uh, the New Testament, it tells you not to give to widows who don't meet the qualifications. Paul said very, very clearly, do not give to a widow unless she is a widow indeed. If she's too young, don't, don't give to her. If she is a busybody, don't give to her. If she is putting, see, he goes through all these things of when not to give to widows. I thought we were supposed to provide for widows and orphans if they meet the qualifications. Once again, there is, there is wisdom involved in being generous. You don't just throw money at people. You don't just give free stuff to people. It keeps them in a state of adolescence, and then you, you prevent them from going spiritually, and then they will have missed an encounter with God that is necessary for their growth. Necessary for their growth. Um, so some of the examples of people who, who we are called to take to, to help, uh, widows who, who meet the qualifications, orphans, those, uh, those that people take advantage of, outcasts, refugees, like the Syrian refugees, um, those in ministry, those in need, fellow Christians, these are all great examples of who to help. But that leads us to another, another, another very, very important point. Giving money is very rarely ever required. See, we think helping someone means I have to give them money. That's not what the Bible says. First off, one of the greatest ways we can help people is by our time. Tell me, what is easier? Trying to put forth an effort to connect with a homeless person so you can help them to grow and to change your life. Or throwing money out your door and driving on. Which is easier? It's a lot easier for me to just give them some money and drive on. Oh, I did my good deed, good deed for the day. 
I've done nothing to help them in real life. I've just given them money. Well, if money could solve all problems, then why do we have problems in the world? I mean, that's just the stupidest thing in the world. Homeless people don't necessarily need money. See, well, the problem is, is that we have this either or fallacy. Either I have to give to everyone with no wisdom and discernment, or I have to give to absolutely nobody. Well, there is a middle ground. Um, so, giving money is very, very rarely uh, ever required. Obviously, I'm not talking about tithes. God tells you to give him the tithe because you're supposed to honor God with your finances. I'm not talking about that at all. Um, but if you turn in Matthew 25, and this will be the last place we look for tonight. Matthew chapter 25. <laughs> So we've looked at, um, you can't help people who don't want to be helped. We've looked at who to give to, and now let's kind of look at how to give. Matthew 25, verse 34. It says this, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, okay, so hunger, feeding them, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. This would be like the food pantry. I was a stranger and you invited me in. Providing hospitality to people. Okay, all right. Uh, naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. Okay, I was in prison and you came to me. Prison visits. Okay, hospital visits. Okay, well, we're getting that idea here. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry? When did we do these things? And he said, anytime you did it to the least of, the, at least of these, you did it to me. Okay, so now... We have a little bit of outline. Give time, give food, give clothes, give instruction. These are all things that the Bible tells us to do. But Americans like to say that we're too busy to help people, so we'd rather just throw money at the problem and hope that it goes away. Well, <laughs> throwing money at problems doesn't fix it. Um, and God didn't call us to throw money away. Okay. Once again, I covered this two weeks ago. When you just throw money at, at, at people who, who don't have um, the discernment about what to do with that money, See, imagine this, okay? You grow up in a home where your father doesn't work. He sits at home all day. And so you're not used to seeing your parents work. Well, then you get to be an adult. And so you file for wel welfare or whatever, and, and, and you don't work. Why should we expect that those people know how to handle money? They need to be taught how to handle money because they weren't taught how to handle money. How would they have any clue? See what I mean? But we just expect that people know what we know. Oh, well, I'm going to give them money. I'm just going to trust that they're going to do what's, what they need to do with it. No, that's not what happens, though. This is what happens. You give them money, they waste it on something, and, they need, they need, and then they need money. Because they don't know how to work. They don't know how to save their money. They don't know how to invest their money. See what I'm getting at here? It is good to be generous. It is better to be wise and generous. It's better to be wise and generous. So, just a few things in, close, in closing. Um, there are homeless people, and then there are lazy people. They're not always the same. Okay? There are those who need help, and then there are fools who, no matter how much you help them, they will always be in the exact same problem, and it will always be everybody else's fault. No matter what, it's always somebody else's fault. Why can't, why can't you afford rent? Well, because of this guy did this, and this guy did this, and my boss hates me. Okay? What? See what I mean? Like, there, there's these extremes. And the thing is, you, you won't really know where people fall in these extremes unless you help them and get to know them. But what we do is we pick and choose who we want to help and how we want to help them. I'll help this guy that I'm driving by Walmart because he's, he's got his bucket and I feel guilty, so I'll give him, I'll give him a buck. That way I, I, I'm free of my obligation. I'm not actually helped this guy. But that way I can go on with my way. That is completely against everything that Christ taught. And then there are people who are fighting addictions, and then there are those people who manipulate them, manipulate you and will lie to you and tell you about how they're trying to change, they're turning over a new leaf, but they're not actually doing those things. They just want you to support them so that they don't have to change. And the thing is, you really have to, once again, be wise. Be wise. So in closing, these two very, very, very important points. Point one, follow God's word and the Holy Spirit. When you're, when, you're, when you're trying to figure out what to do, follow God's word. There's your outline right there. But then sometimes things, sometimes we don't really understand what the Bible is saying sometimes. We don't really read it or whatever. 
And so then there's also the Holy Spirit who gives us prompts. You know what I mean? What we like to do is we like to kind of ignore the Holy Spirit if he's saying something that we don't like. See what I mean? Like, okay, well, I want to support my child, so even though they're not being responsible, I'm going to support them. Are they an adult? I'm not talking about four or five-year-olds here. I'm talking about 30, 40, 50-year-old sons and daughters. I mean, it's time that, you know, they, they leave the nest. And I do really mean leave the nest. Um, so, and then also, uh, I guess this would be the final, final point, as Chuck likes to say, you have limited resources, use them wisely. If you spend all your resources on people who don't, need, don't want the help, you won't be able to help the people who need the help, okay? Never forget that, never forget that. You will either spend your money on yourself, or you will spend it on, on, on just throwing it away, like giving it to people who don't want help, or you will give it to God's kingdom. And you will help the widows, and you will help the orphans, you will help people who actually need it. So once again, Christianity is about generosity, but it's about being wise with that generosity. And we're going to stop there. Um, can I have um, Chuck closes in prayer?